Now we're going to bring on, we're very happy that we are starting a partnership with um, law enforcement, getting to know who these folks are who are out there, who handle the stuff going on in our community, and um, so that we can be networking with them. They know who we are and get to know who all of you are. And um, so we can all be supportive of uh, what's, what's happening. And very, very happy to have these gentlemen here today. So it's my pleasure to introduce to you Sergeant Tony Doniger, Detective Jerry Haynes, and Lieutenant Glenn Parkus. And they're going to talk to us about the law enforcement perspective. Thank you, gentlemen. Good morning. Uh, thanks to Tina for kind of laying out the um, KRS as far as the, the statutes that we have to follow um, as well as like the red flag type thing. So I thought I would take this opportunity just talk about the unit, talk about um, the boots on the ground, um, who you have within LMPD to investigate these types of uh, offenses. So um, I'm Sergeant Tony Doniger. I've done LMPD about 15 years, I would say. Um, Lieutenant Glenn Parkus, he's been with LMPD about 16 years. And then Detective Jerry Arms, he's been with LMPD about 11 years. So we'll talk about the makeup of the unit. So we have, uh, we are under the Major Crimes Division. So Major Matt Mayer kind of oversees. Uh, we fall with uh, Special Victims Unit, we fall with homicide, robbery, so we have Lieutenant Parkes, myself, uh, Sergeant Manasili could not be here today. Um, and with addition to Jerry, we have 11 other detectives uh, within our unit. We also have two civilian administrative clerks. Um, so within the types of cases that we investigate, so we merged um, at the start of 2021. Uh, when I went to the sex crimes unit in November of 20, I, did, I had no knowledge of this merger. Um, and, um, due to staffing issues, LMPD decided that we were going to merge the units. So, sex crimes merged with crimes against children, and then we also absorbed crimes against seniors. Uh, so, we, were, we merged as one unit with a new name, OSPE, which is the Office of Sexual and Physical Investigations, and that we are in its, in its infancy, but that started in January. Of 2021 and uh, we are located at 512 West Kentucky Street downtown so the crimes against children unit uh, they investigate physical assault against children whether they be misdemeanors or felonies also any misdemeanor or sexual assault or I'm sorry misdemeanor or felony sexual assault against children uh, as well as The Internet Crimes Against Children. So we have one detective who is our ICAC detective, Internet Crimes Against Children, and she works with the FBI. So she has FBI clearance. Uh, she spends the majority of her day out at the FBI. Um, and any Internet Crimes Against Children complaints that come in, we'll get to a, st a statistic on that later. Um, detective Payne handles all those. So the Sex Crimes Unit, uh, we handle the felony adult sexual assaults. So the age of consent in Kentucky is 16. So we handle anything 16 and over. Uh, we also take care of the sex offenders in Jefferson County, as well as human trafficking complaints. And we also manage and investigate the sexual assault backlog uh, that I will kind of touch base on um, in a minute. So our Crimes Against Seniors Unit, which is also under us, we handle the physical assault on adults by caretakers whether it be a, a family member or somebody who's at an assisted living facility, um, we would handle if there's any type of physical abuse against a, a senior. So for 2021 data, as a unit, we had 548 sexual assault cases, 124 physical assault cases. Uh, we took warrants out on 20 sex offenders who were non-compliant. 
Uh, we handled 178 internet crime against children complaints, and then approximately 45 human trafficking complaints. So it's a lot of a lot of work for 12, 12 detectives and two sergeants. So one of our great partners, a uh, program that LMPD started maybe within the last five to seven years, is we have our own victim services unit. They are a group of civilians that they assist the families of homicide victims, they assist our victims, and they they have an on-call rotation as well. So if a, uh, you know, if a detective gets called out at 3 o'clock in the morning to go to U of Hospital and there's a victim that's having a sexual assault kit done, uh, the detective will respond and ask them, like, what type of resources do you need? What, what do you, what can I get you tonight? Do you need some stay? Do you need some money? Stuff like that. And the detective will call out a member of the victim services unit, and they can respond um, and provide these short-term uh, resources. So the victim services unit is made up of a director, who is Nicole Carroll. She's wonderful. There are two supervisors and eight victim service specialists. They are trying to get some more. I think they've posted a job opportunity for uh, an opening in the unit. Um, so basically, if the victim wishes, that's the most important thing. That victims in Kentucky, rightfully so, they have a right to not report. They can go to uh, the hospital, they can choose to have a, a sexual assault kit done, but then they may say, I don't want to uh, include law enforcement. And oftentimes, U uh, of L, we have business cards down there for the detectives, if that is the choice of the victim, then one of the nurses will give the on-call detective's card to the victim, and if she decides she wants to make contact, she at least has that. Um, U of L will then keep the kit for one year before it is destroyed to give the victim an opportunity uh, if she wants to change her mind. So, and a victim is, um, they can get all the resources, right? If there's, you know, fear of maybe uh, attracting some type of STD from the sexual assaults or what have you, um, they will still get, it's obviously a free exam, they don't have to pay for anything, they can get the medication that they need, they can get all the resources, even if they don't want to, you know, talk to a detective. So the Victim Services Unit, they're a, they're a wonderful um, partner that, that I'm happy to have a part of the LPD. So they will then kind of work with the victim, they'll provide updates with the victim as far as the status of the case as it goes on through the court proceedings. Um, and they also coordinate, like I said, short-term uh, help, and if there is long-term necessity for from treatment or whatnot, then the victim services unit can also get that set up and scheduled. So I mentioned the, the backlog. Um, as a kind of a national issue, law enforcement agencies across the country did not have the resources to send off rape kits, have the funding to pay for all of them. So in 2000, 16, uh, the district attorney of New York was like, he realized that it was a, a problem across the United States. So he was able to work with the federal government and he received federal funding to be dished out to all pretty much law enforcement agencies across the United States to have all of their great backlog kits that had never been sent off to be tested, sent off. So back in 2016, LMPD, which was a merger, if you're not from here, LMPD was a merger of the old Jefferson County Police Department and the Louisville Police Department. So that merger occurred in 2003. So back in roughly 2016, 2017, LMPD now had all these kits sent off to be tested. And we had approximately 2,500 kits that had not been tested. For the state of Kentucky, there were 4,500 uh, kits that had not been tested. So Obviously, Lowell will be in the big city. We have the most uh, kits that were sent off. So that is something that we work daily. I, mean, I get anywhere from 20 to 150 emails a week with these responses just coming back, coming back. I mean, we work with um, the Center for Women and Families. We work with uh, other organizations to attempt to notify these victims. Sometimes it's been 40 years, and we've had cases from the 70s that you know we've we've contacted victims and they don't want to know. They don't want to know the, the result. What's that? I totally understand. Uh, we will provide them our contact information, and if they change their mind and they say, you know what, like I had a lady call me 
uh, like last week, and I talked to her about six months ago. And she said I was at a treatment facility. She was like, I didn't want to know. I didn't want to know then. She's like, but I want to know now. So luckily we've had some success with, you know, some serial cases. Um, we sent two detectives to Oklahoma last February to um, interview a gentleman that uh, was in custody, serving a life sentence in Oklahoma for uh, sexual assault. Uh, we got a hit back from a, I think it was like a 1987 case. And uh, the detectives went and interviewed him. He admitted to that. He admitted to another sexual assault. And they admitted to a third sexual assault that we, we didn't have a record of. The victim had never um, filed that complaint. So it's nice, you know, 35 years later to be able to provide closure um, for these victims. So that's kind of a LMPD in a nutshell. You know, I know, as Tina talked about the, the Kentucky Revised Statutes, the human trafficking laws. Um, she also touched on some red flags. Um, I had a little, there's a packet in your folder there, probably in the back, that kind of some myths and whatnot when it comes to human trafficking. Uh, things to look for, place the uh, folks to contact. And as she mentioned, the, the Polaris, which is a national organization, we do get those emails um, fairly frequently and we'll obviously assign those to a detective. Does anybody have any questions? I know I kind of went through that pretty quick. Yes. I, I wanted to know on the right pits, why Bell, uh, Hunter, and Hunter Hill disappeared and then went to Michigan. Do you think that that's adequate time for a person to make a survive? Or is it something that's good for why they do that? That's a good question. I don't know. So I know that we, by law, have, so when UL notifies us of a rape kit, we have a certain amount of time before we have to go down and get it. And then we have within a month, we have to send it off to the lab to be tested. As far as UL, I think that may just be their policy. Um, I don't want to assume, obviously I don't work for UL, but my assumption would be storage may be an issue. Um, yes? Is that a statute of limitations on UL? Or is that a crime? So, that's a great question. So a felony in Kentucky, there is zero statute of limitations. So if you are a victim of a felony now and you decide in 30 years you want to pursue it, no problem. A misdemeanor, um, which obviously like rape, sodomy, that, that's not a misdemeanor, that's one year. So if you, you know, let's say, I don't know, somebody punches me in the face, that's going to be an assault for um, misdemeanor. So if I don't figure out who it is or I don't press charges within a year, then I, I, that, you can't do anything about it. now. If you have a warrant, like let's say I hit you and uh, you take a warrant out of me and the police don't find me for a year, that warrant is still good. That warrant will be good forever. So it's all in when the warrant is, is taken out and hope I'll answer your question. Anybody else have any questions? Yes? Do you see a difference as far as the amount of things that are happening? Did the pandemic change anything? So the pandemic definitely slowed it down. Uh, I don't know if it slowed down reporting because Victims were afraid to go to the hospital because of all the COVID patients being in the hospital. Um, the bars were closed, so instances of victims being drugged or roofied or things happening to their drinks, that obviously kind of planed off. From 2020 to 2021, I think our rapes were down like 10%. So like nothing drastic, but I think with the bars being closed and victims being afraid, like I said, to go to the hospital because of COVID, that probably. But obviously if they choose to now to, to come out and report it, they can. I mean, like I said, there's no statute of limitations. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Well, I didn't say, I've heard a, um, a nurse talk from UML, and they have a list of questions to go through, and also to separate whoever brought them in from the person being interviewed. And then is it the victim's choice to get a rape kit? Or is that something that would just be done because it's a under suspect? Uh, it is all up to the victim. I mean, obviously, okay. having a sexual assault exam done is not a pleasant process. I mean, it's very... I've never had one done. It's very invasive. I mean, I've seen pictures. I've seen, you know, I've talked to victims that have had it done. So a lot of them just don't want 
to go through that. I mean, what they've had done is humiliating enough that it's, some of them think it's embarrassing. Some think they did something wrong. Obviously, they didn't. But, and then they have to subject themselves to this exam, which obviously from a law enforcement perspective is extremely important. That's where we get our evidence. So no, they, we don't obviously make the victims, we don't even make the victims go to the hospital. Um, I would say 65% of our cases come from a SANE nurse, which is a sexual assault nurse examiner from UofL getting a hold of, of our office to respond and make contact with the victim. Yes? Hi, uh, what's the time ago I had somebody break into um, my work stealing stuff out of the uh, vending machine? And when the officer came in, he uh, he literally had the picture of the guy who was there because I'm doing such a great job. You know what's going on in the in the world. Um, do you know what where are the places in Louisville that people are being trafficked or sold or? Uh, since Greyhound, since the bus comp depot shut down, that is like, we would see obviously victims get trafficked through there. Um, when the Farm Machinery Show comes to town in February, that's a big one. And no joke, and I'm not trying to make light of it, but Derby, seriously, they call the Super Bowl of human trafficking. Um, so we're already in the midst of planning our, our detail for, for this year. Um, as far as locations, it can happen anywhere. It can happen in Easton, it can happen in Weston, it can happen everywhere. And people, you know, and, and what we've, it, I've been in the unit 15 months, and, and what I've found is, kind of the summer's point is you can want to want to help the victims but they may not want help at that time so you just kind of have to be there for them when they're ready because some of them they don't know that they're being trapped they don't they've never had attention from their parents whatever and these the traffickers it's kind of like Stockholm syndrome like you you're attached to these traffickers and as bad as it is there is a level of comfort there so we just have to be they have to be ready to help them when they want. I would say that human trafficking and domestic violence have a lot of similarities as far as drug use. And he is right. 99.9% of us don't use drugs. We're being trafficked with the language you all use. That's not the language that we use. And so we, you know, I, I found out I was a trafficking survivor actually at a conference just like this. I was supposed to set a table up to sell some soap and see all the things and realize that I was a victim. And everybody around me asked, why did you tell me this? To me, I thought that was pretty oh, bullshit, sorry. Because um, I was like, why didn't somebody clue me in, you know? Um, so that was pretty good in itself. But yeah, most of us have no clue into the world law. And even then, it takes some time, even after, because you may fall, you may see the checklist, and you might not even recognize that that because our pimps are our boyfriends. Stockholm syndrome is very real. You know, at one point in time, it's like a domestic violence. We left that person, or we thought highly of them, or, you know, whatever way you think got us hooked. Um, but yeah, we don't need change to having this down. Leave it right here. And I think it's worth mentioning as well. So, with the child, crimes against children cases, so typically if you're under the age of 16 and you're a victim of anything, whether it be a physical assault, sexual assault, unrelated human trafficking, the, the Commonwealth, which are the attorneys that prosecute these cases for us, they want the victims to be forensically interviewed. So. That is not a detective sitting down and talking to a, a 12 or 13 year old victim of human trafficking or any type of sexual or physical assault by a caretaker. It is a civilian who is specially trained, and it's amazing because they don't know anything about the case. They literally know nothing about it. They're handed the person's name, and then just through their training and just having a conversation with these kids, they figure out what it is. Now, the detective is observing, and the detective is taking notes, and then once the forensic interviewer figures out, kind of, okay, this is the Hot button issue. This is why this kid's here. Because it's, you know, a defense attorney would eat it alive. Like, there's no bias. So, the, like I said, the forensic interview has no idea why this kid's in there. Then they'll, come, sorry. then they'll come in and they'll talk to the detective and say, okay, give me follow up questions. What else can I ask this, this child or whatever? So, just, I just think it's worth noting. And a lot of the trafficking victims are they're runaways. So, you may have them today and you may put them in a, you know, a living facility or something and you schedule the forensic interview tomorrow. And they're gone. So, so you run, we're, we're fearful. We're out of fear. And, you know, not for anything, but you have to understand that the whole time we're being groomed and everything like that, no matter what age you are, they are the enemy. You are the enemy. You all are going to be the ones to hurt us. They're going to be the ones to hurt us. Not the pimp that's pre feeding us and selling us, you know, but those guys are bad. You all are bad. And how you would never want to help somebody like me. For many, many years. Uh, were, were any of you involved in 
just the one over the summer? I think. I think they got the 29th. No, ma'am. Okay. Yes, sir. What kind of collaboration do you want to uh, work on with the state especially when it comes to the So, Louisville is an interesting dynamic because within Louisville, you've got the Jefferson County Police Department, you've got Shively Police Department, you've got St. Matthews Police Department. So we are in the midst now of starting up like a, a human trafficking, not a unit, but just to get information because things are happening in our back door in J-Town that we don't know about because they call the police within J-Town, J-Town goes. Uh, but KSB, we, we have a, a contact at KSB and also the uh, Attorney General's office that we, uh, that we work with. That's what I was looking for. I was looking for task force, yes. Thank you. Thank you.